Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Grace, so I'm president of business today, and I'm so happy to welcome um, Phil Rapaner from Upper Quad. He's the CEO and founder, um, and it's super exciting to have him here uh, through this keynote. We're going to talk about, you know, how he entered his journey um, becoming a founder in the design world, um, and I'm going to give it to Phil to provide an intro on himself. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Phil. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm the, uh, as Grace said, I'm the founder. I just wanted to thank uh, Business Today um, for having me at the at this conference. It's kind of an interesting and new format, but I definitely appreciate um, the chance to talk with you guys and, and to uh, to be here. Um, Alyssa, Grace, and Benjamin, thank you. You guys are doing a tremendous job, and I really deeply appreciate uh, being here to do the uh, keynote. Um, so with that, I think I, maybe I'll jump into it. Um, I'm gonna actually just start and tell you a little bit about um, Upperquad and what we do, if that's okay. Um, so we've been lucky enough to kind of participate in this for the last three years. Uh, we're a creative company. Uh, we're based in San Francisco and Berlin. This is some of our work that we do. Um, we, we work with Google, Patagonia, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Fine Arts Museum, uh, and a whole lot of others. Um, this is just kind of a very quick uh, glance at sort of the kind of work that we do. Um, this is our what our offices look like uh, back when we had uh, when everybody was going to offices. Um, the thing I'm really the most proud of and everything that I've done in the last uh, ten years with Upperquad is the the people that are actually uh, part of the team. Um, you can see kind of uh, us sort of collaborating here. Uh, we obviously like walnut, white space, and plants, um, but this is sort of uh, this is sort of what makes this all go. And this is actually what we look like these days. Um, so, just like this conference, just like everything else, uh, it's all Zoom all the time. And um, we've uh, been been sort of uh, working from home for the last couple of weeks, uh, making the transition the best we can. Um, and that's probably where everybody else is in the world. Um, you know, it's probably worth mentioning, talking about sort of COVID-19, uh, because that's sort of the lens that we're all sort of viewing the world. So uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that um, and how that's sort of going and what designers can kind of take away from that. Um, when we went home uh, in March, when we started our shelter in place, we thought it was a very sort of linear Thing. We'd go home and then, you know, we'd go back um, to our sort of lives and it would all sort of be waiting there. And what we found out is that <laughs> it wasn't that simple. Um, so the, uh, there's a lot of transition going on at the time, uh, at this time. And there's a lot of, it's very tumultuous and uh, everybody's sort of dealing with this um, uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, what we, you know, we, we talk a lot about being sort of all in this together. And, you know, I think we are, but we're also finding ourselves to be all alone together in a lot of ways. Um, you know, the, the, the pandemic side of this is, is horrific, uh, as is the sort of economic side. Um, and we're all sort of dealing with this sort of new reality. Um, I keep saying this to everybody at Upper Quad. Um, we're, we're really not going back. We, we're not, we won't come out the same way that we went in. Um, and I, I really do believe that there's gonna be some fundamental shifts and kind of how we do things and what's now important. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, if you guys have ever taken a uh, psychology class, this might've sort of come up. Um, and basically the idea is there's, there's a couple different versions of this some have like eight levels. There's, there's some that, that have different sort of, uh, they've been adjusted to, uh, to different disciplines. But basically the idea is if you are not taking care of these base level uh, needs, you can't really think past them. Uh, so you have to have your, your sort of basic needs sort of taken care of. And um, where we are sort of as, uh, you know, I would say as a society almost globally is we're all focused on this base level. This is, we've, we've kind of been shaken to the core. Um, so this is no real small thing. 
And I, just to kind of reframe that through the, eye, through the eyes of sort of a designer, um, this is a quote from Charles Ames. The role of the designer is basically that of a good host, uh, anticipating the needs of guests. So if we're at a point where we, where everybody's needs are uh, focused on the, the very sort of basic needs, how do we design and, and what's the role of design sort of going forward? Um, I think generally when we think about design, um, you kind of always have to ask yourself a, a couple of questions. This is, you know, maybe across disciplines, um, but you know, what might people need? Um, what, what might people like and what might people want? Um, and we're starting to kind of get some initial answers on those questions. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see what's happening. So there's a couple things that, that I sort of see. Uh, the first one is that our relationship with technology is changing. Um, screen time is no longer sort of social limiting, socially limiting. Uh, I think last year I was really concerned with how much screen time I was engaging in. And now it's really the connective tissue um, to a lot, of, a lot of our lives. We've seen school move online um, with dis distance learning becoming a little bit more common or absolutely a lot more common actually, uh, both at K through 12 and through universities. We've seen Zoom become a household name um, and other technologies are gonna get kind of pushed forward. So, you know, uh, using contactless payments like Apple Pay and Android Pay were kind of a novelty in a lot of ways. Um, but I think now, I think we're gonna see them be a little bit more uh, a, not a nice to have, but just almost a requirement. Um, and you can start to see where you might rethink things like uh, safety questions around driverless cars. Uh, it, it might be actually more unsafe at this point to step in a car with an actual human being. So some of these things that we're, we sort of have uh, made sense in some ways uh, will start to shift in, in, in how we relate to them. Um, there's a huge rethinking in the way we live and work. Um, every room is now kind of multi-purpose. Uh, this, you know, your dining room might also be an office. In my case, it's um, it's the stage of a, a conference. Uh, it could be an art studio, it could be a gym, it could be a classroom, and then you know you have to shift back to uh, you know a place to eat and a place to relax. Um, the draw of living in high density urban areas um, might be waning. Um, it was always sort of a nice thing, but um, you know, now the idea of being around a lot of people is not as enticing. Uh, people are working from home and we're seeing a lot of people who don't want to come back. Um, you know, I think we, uh, there's a lot of tech companies. I think Twitter said people can work uh, from home indefinitely. Um, some other people can. And I think Google and Facebook are also doing some similar, uh, also treating it in a similar way. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, change in the way that people expect to work and how they want to work. Um, proximity to nature and outdoor spaces is actually now sort of a, a premium. Um, and we're also going to see sort of companies in the, in the sharing economy, uh, they're going to have to really adjust their models. Um, you know, it, it might have uh, made sense to, to use ride hailing or co-working spaces. Um, but now, you know, when you're concerned about physical safety, uh, you have to rethink how those things work. Um, the other thing that I think we're seeing is that how we shop is, is fundamentally changing. Um, uh, online retail is now, I think, at 25% of, of uh, all U.S. Uh, spend. Um, Instacart, we saw their valuation go up by 50%. They, they had their first profit. Uh, Amazon said last week that they're going to hire about 100,000 new employees just to keep up with demand. And at the same time, we're seeing traditional retailers uh, like J.C. Penney and Neiman Marcus and J. Crew announcing bank bankruptcies, and I think the way that people are communicating is going to change the the way that they they expect to be uh, they expect brands and companies to communicate with them is going to change as well. Uh, authenticity, I think, is a must, um, and we're also going to see people really leaning, uh, looking for escape and nostalgia. Um, you can kind of see overnight how how brand communication. Brand communication has changed. Um, uh, there was all, all of a sudden, I think all the ads on TV all pretty much look the same. And in some ways, some of that auth authenticity was inauthentic, uh, but the instinct was correct. And I think we'll see more of that. Um, I think from a design perspective, we'll probably see a lot more subdued color palettes um, because candy colored visions of the future no longer will really ring true. 
Um, in terms of escape, we see a lot of people buying video games. Uh, streaming is through the roof. Um, and as sort of hard days are ahead of us, change coming really fast, uh, nostalgia is going to start to have a really uh, big pull uh, on people. Um, so, and also just on a very related note, if you're not watching that Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance, I, I highly recommend it. A um, little bit of my nostalgia for the past. But I think out of all this, um, we see one thing that's kind of the same for, for what designers and what designers do. So from these emerging needs, from these beliefs and from these technologies, designers have always found solutions. Um, and I don't think that's going to fundamentally change. Uh, the, 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 uh, the parameters might change, but this doesn't. And this is what we do. Um, for me, this is always really what's drawn me to, to design. There's sort of a certain amount of uh, inherent optimism uh, in what we do and this belief that we can make things better, uh, even if they're incrementally better. Um, and uh, really sort of, we want to attack sort of problems and engage with them on a deeper level. And I think there's new problems and a lot of problems to kind of engage with. Who knows how quickly they'll subside, but I think this will be sort of a, a defining moment for us um, for, the, uh, for the immediate future. Um, this is sort of how we work with our clients too. This is what this is a little bit of what we do. We really try to get into the problems. We truly really try to understand them and, and offer insights. Um, and this is really the the foundation of of what we do um, is getting into this. Um, we kind of talk about the the pursuit. Um, this is something we say sort of where we talk about at Upper Quad. Uh, every project we have starts with the desire to make something extraordinary. Um, and no matter what we're doing, um, we're, we're trying to make uh, amazing sort of experiences and um, solve problems for, for our clients. So I, I wanna sh show you a little bit about sort of what we do and uh, what this actually means in practice. Um, uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the work that we've actually done for Jigsaw. Um, they're uh, a unit within Google that uh, is using technology to sort of identify, understand, and constrain uh, threats on the internet. Um, they have a, a bunch of different products that they, projects and products that they use. They work with a lot of different groups. Um, they're working sort of against, uh, working to sort of contain disinformation, um, working to sort of uh, identify deep fakes, um, really trying to make uh, all the awful things that go on the internet um, uh, sort of controlled or contained. So we've been really lucky to work with them um, on building an identity uh, and a system for them. Um, you can kind of see here where the, the, the Jigsaw J sort of comes from. Um, and it's, it's a really tight crop on actually a, a puzzle piece. Um, it's not a very, it's not too literal. If you didn't know it, you probably wouldn't know it, but it's a nice sort of tie back to the name itself. Uh, we work with them to sort of create this identity system. Uh, we, we show some of these color palettes um, that we, we set up for them. Um, and also uh, how we, we could sort of build a brand for them, um, how these things would sort of manifest themselves in a way to sort of explain what they did uh, and work together. Um, one of the problems they have is that if you're talking about disinformation or uh, you know, violence on the internet, extremism. Um, you don't always want to, we can't always show it. Um, some of the, some of the information, they don't want to tip their hand and what they're exactly doing or how they're doing it. Um, and some of the information is just a little too graphic to really show. So the solution that we came up to that is actually creating, uh, for them, uh, a really distinct typeface. Um, and, uh, it's nice to create typefaces, but for them, if they're doing a lot of things that are very, um, uh, very much sort of text driven, um, this was a way for us to kind of give them a way, uh, give them a means to create very distinct um, typography. Uh, so this was a really uh, integral part in kind of creating a system um, and, and allowing them to sort of extend their brand. Um, this is sort of, this is where it, how it landed on the on the internet um, on the on their website 
uh, we created a lot of um, visual sort of aesthetics and uh, pulled these pieces together to, to tell sort of a larger story. Uh, in addition, um, we created, uh, we actually worked with uh, really closely with Jigsaw and uh, Imprint um, uh, Studios to create uh, a, uh, a uh, publication. This is sort of an online, um, online only uh, sort of thing, uh, but was sort of a way to start to talk about what they were doing uh, and specifically the issues that they were sort of um, addressing. Um, so uh, we work with them to, to sort of design and build this uh, as well as, you know, some of the, the, the data visualization pieces, um, but working within the, an existing brand that we had created, but also sort of extending it to, to, um, to different areas. We've also been really lucky to work with Patagonia. Um, and one of the things we've, we're always doing is uh, creating uh, experiences that take people to the places that they should be caring about. So this was a, a project we did uh, around um, the building of dams in, in um, Eastern Europe, but we wanted to sort of not just tell people about what we were doing, we wanted to show them in a very visual way, um, using maps and technology to kind of uh, almost be a window to, the, to these worlds uh, and allow people to really engage with them. Uh, this was a project we did with them around uh, Bears Ears National Monument. Um, and thinking about how we use technologies, um, we didn't get to go on this photo shoot. We really, we dropped a lot of hints and we really, really made uh, made it clear that we were happy to go uh, and go rock climbing and, and uh, bike riding and trail running for a week. But um, this is some some of the beautiful footage that they brought us back, uh, drone footage and 360 footage. And we thought about ways of how do we uh, make it easy for people to explore and to kind of get a sense of this, these places. Um, and even, you know, how do we take it to that next step and create a sort of VR experience that people can engage with? This is something they actually did in their uh, in their stores where they would pop these into a, a cardboard and you could sort of take a look around the, 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 the spaces. Um, for us, we, we always, we do all also create the, uh, the, the marks and the symbols that give meaning and, and they can extend. This is something they use for their campaign. Uh, it started off as just a loader, actually, um, but sort of became a, a mark and a symbol for them. And there's other work we do, too. Um, this is um, a project we did with A26 Valencia. They're a, uh, they're a program here in, in, uh, in San Francisco. There's also some in, uh, in different cities uh, throughout, the, throughout the U.S., uh, but they work with underprivileged kids on, on creative writing and, and tutoring, um, and we completely reorganized their website. Um, but the thing that I'm most proud of is not sort of the whimsy and the and the illustration, although I do love that. But it's actually uh, we spent a lot of time with them uh, going through their volunteer experience uh, because that was the biggest one of the biggest problems is is getting volunteers in and getting them um, through their process and getting them to sign up. So actually going through that process and 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 attacking it from a design perspective uh, was something we could solve and it actually had some real impact. And I think our work also, I think that sort of curiosity and I think that um, this sort of desire, this pursuit also extends to the work that we do for ourselves. Um, sometimes we don't get the exact projects we want, um, so we, we, can, we might make them up. Um, and this is something we did when we opened our Berlin office. So it's, it's a poster generator. It creates posters that uh, you know, we, we wanted to say hello from Berlin, but we also wanted to allow people to create their own. So it, it takes wherever your location is and based on the time of day, the weather, the, the wind speed, it creates these really custom graphics based on uh, an existing system. Um, so you could create your poster, add it to the gallery and download it. Uh, and one of the things the team there did was um, we even extended it. Um, we, we took it out of the, the digital world and on a really tight, Sort of budget, we actually put these up throughout um, throughout Berlin, which was uh, really an exciting thing. Um, we've done some projects too where we uh, collaborated. Um, this is a, a project we did called Beacon that uh, was in 2017. I think there was I think it was three hurricanes and uh, two uh, series of wildfires, and it was just sort of one thing after another, and we were feeling pretty down about just about everything. Um, but we reached out to a lot of different artists 
And uh, we got collaboration from some of the people we admire really the most. Uh, we created a website where you could actually uh, buy, the, um, buy the posters, buy the artwork. Um, and we gave all the money to uh, Direct Relief who, who were actually um, helping out. Um, and it was a small way for us to really kind of give back. Um, but we also just sometimes make things. Um, and I think there's, there's really, um, I think that's really sort of uh, a big thing about uh, what makes it special is that there's always a desire to make something new and make something different, something that sort of positively reflects who we are and really is an interesting and engaging, um, uh, interesting and engaging work. So I just awesome. I was thinking about this quite a bit. Um, the future won't be perfect, um, but it will get better. Um, and I think we, as designers, do have a role in making it uh, better. Um, and I, I really do believe that, that um, there's gonna be, there's a lot of problems that we're facing and uh, we as designers uh, will be defined by the solutions that we come up to them. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that was um, a really nice presentation. And I think you covered a lot of uh, topics that we actually wanted to talk about in terms of social impact, which is the theme of this conference. Um, and, you know, seeing how, uh, you know, whether it's kind of how the sharing economy has to change, or as, as you mentioned, like how we're looking at uh, screen time differently and how technology's impact will change in this new world um, is impacting design. So I think that's really, really awesome. So uh, before we continue, I know someone has already started using Q&A, but I just wanna make sure all attendees are aware that um, on like the middle of your screen, feel free to submit questions because in a couple of minutes, we'll open up Q&A to have uh, you guys ask questions to fill. So um, shifting the conversation a little more towards uh, you yourself as a designer, I was just wondering, um, you studied legal studies and politics at UC Santa Cruz. How did you initially enter the design industry? Did you always have an interest in design? And um, you know, were there like challenges you were facing or you found that it was a relatively smooth entrance into the industry? Yeah, no, I, that's a good question. I think that um, really it's sort of, I was always interested in art. Um, I didn't even know design existed, uh, to be totally honest. Um, I think if I had, I, I might have more actively pursued it. But um, one of the things I learned about uh, studying legal studies and politics was that I didn't want to do either. And when I got out of school, I think what was going on at that time was uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, the first dot com sort of uh, wave. And the internet was a new thing um, and was really exciting. Um, I had uh, I had kind of dabbled in building. I'd taken a couple of classes and actually like building websites. And it was sort of more of just a side interest. And as I started to get going uh, with my career, I, I did a couple of things and just kind of kept coming back to design. It was always uh, usually an aspect of what I did. Like no, no matter where I was, I was working on somebody's website somewhere. Um, but I never knew, I mean, there was a point I think where I thought I was gonna go back and do uh, international studies. Um, uh, just, I've always appreciated languages and I just thought that that was the thing that I wanted to do. But uh, after looking at what you could do after that, I looked at the kinds of jobs that people were getting and I just said, this is not, this is not it. Um, so being in San Francisco, being from the area, um, this was something that I really, you know, it's something that was here that was sort of current. And uh, I just started getting more into it. Some of it was self-taught. Uh, I worked with a studio called Cuban Council, which was eye-opening because they were doing work with, um, you know, Google and uh, Epitaph Records, and they were just doing it at an extremely high level. And for me, that was uh, transformational. Um, and from that, I sort of learned a lot and kind of continued to build and grow. Uh, and when I had the opportunity to, to start Upper Quad, um, it was, you know, it was just me in a spare bedroom. Um, and uh, I had, um, you know, I started doing the things that I had learned um, I had, you know, it's, it's all sort of based on relationships too. There's a lot of people I knew um, from doing that kind of work. And uh, one thing just sort of led to another. Um, 
you know, there's a challenge in moving into any sort of, uh, there's, there's always a challenge in moving into any sort of uh, career, career path. But I think if you're passionate about it, if, if, this, if it's the thing that you want to do, if, if you really engage with it deeply, um, I think that's the only, you know, that's, that's what's always driven me. And that's, that's what's gotten me, you know, taking this from something I'd like to do to something that I'm doing. Awesome. And following from that question, so you, you entered design and then you founded Upper Quad. What led you through that founding journey? Were there any like hard or soft skills? I know you talked about relationship building, but, um, you know, any other skills, especially for some of the people who are attending this conference, they might not have a strong background in design. What do you think really helped you during that founding journey? Yeah, that's a good question. No, I think, I think if you were founding a company, if you're starting anything, you have to do a lot of things and you got to wear a lot of hats. And, um, you know, when, when it started, I was doing just about everything. Um, and, you know, whether from design to talking to clients to, um, you know, I was actually doing some of the development at some point, which is sort of horrifying to think at this, at this moment. Um, but I think that the soft skills are really important um, and having that combination. Um, but, you know, that the, the, not everybody needs to sort of go out and, and be a founder necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of um, design is actually really ingrained in a lot of different uh, companies at this point. It's sort of accepted. I, I do remember when I started, it wasn't really a thing. And, um, you know, I think around 2008, 2009, designers started having a seat at the table it wasn't it wasn't this sort of add-on it was sort of this um you know it wasn't a nice to have it was sort of baked into what companies were doing in, in terms of building their products in terms of building experiences um the level of des- the, the expectations of design were um just all of a sudden a whole lot greater um so uh yeah i, I mean anyways i i do think that uh being open i think uh, being able to kind of, um, you know, design itself is always changing. Uh, the, the, the methodology can, somewhat can remain the same, but, um, you know, the, the things that inspire people and the, the things that are important sort of, uh, evolve. So I think keeping an open mind, uh, keeping engaged, uh, is really helpful. Um, when you're starting saying a lot of yeses, I think that's something I did really early on. Um, I think we were talking earlier about uh, how we got some of those early projects with Google, um, like Santa Tracker. And some of that was just saying yes to just about everything. So um, anytime they had a, a something new or something different, you know, instead of saying, well, you know, we haven't done this, or I don't know, uh, the answer was yes. And um, a lot of those yeses led to, to really great projects. A lot of them led to very odd projects, but, um, you know, I think they were important to say early on. Um, as you develop, you can say, no, it's not a good, it's not, it's, it's the, it's not the best answer. Uh, sometimes you have to say it. Um, but when you're getting started, you got to find a way to, to, to say those yeses. Awesome. So I'm going to uh, take a look at Q and a now and ask some questions from there. And then also attendees make sh- you guys can upvote as well. Um, so from Caleb Potts, he asked, you probably all know that as designers talking about our work is just as important as designing the work, but it can often be a lot harder. Do you have any tips or suggestions on how to sell ourselves and our work effectively when we're all just beginning our careers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's as important to be able to sell your work as it is um, to actually do it. I mean, you have to have both pieces. Um, if you have a really great solution to a problem and you can't explain it to your client, and you can't get them on board, um, it, it, you might as well not have had it. So. Uh, early on, it's it's a really difficult thing because you're you're trying to kind of build something out of nothing and um, uh, or build not from nothing but from starting from zero. So uh, it's an interesting and unique challenge. I, I think there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, uh, a lot of it is in presentation. Even you know even the uh, even a project that is not completely kind of fleshed out, the way you present it can really um, can really make it look a lot better or really tell the story a little bit better. So finding those different moments, finding those things in the, the project or the design itself that are features or things you're proud of or things that you're excited about and really pulling those out in a way and, 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 and showcasing them. So 
instead of just showing your mobile, like if you're designing a product and you're just showing your mobile screen, just like a screenshot of it that you just put up, that's one thing, but maybe, you know, you can show it in situation. Maybe you can put it in a, you can um, find a rendered phone that you're sort of, you know, giving people context. Maybe you can do a very simple uh, photo shoot um, just to kind of give a, a broader, uh, a broader view of the work that you're doing. So a lot of times we'll see folks that, you know, um, have, have very similar kind of levels of work that they're showing, but the way they're showing it really determines whether we're interested in uh, working with them or not. And uh, I think finding, finding a way to sort of sell that work, finding a way to make it interesting, make it engaging, um, and finding those projects that you're passionate about and whether you're, you know, I, I think the, the last thing to do is to, to, you know, everybody has to start from somewhere and we all understand that, uh, everybody has. So, um, you don't need to apologize for that. You just need to, um, show work that, that uh, find ways to show your work, um, in, in a truly engaging way. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And I think, um, given, all you've done through Upper Quad, it really shows through that. So moving on to, um, you know, saying yes to all of these projects, when you do get a project with a client, so um, I have Jonathan, he's asking, uh, can you tell us a little about what the process looks like when you start with a new client or project to find their brand voice and help them craft an identity through design? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so the first thing that we do is what we call discovery. So we sit down with a client, we'll usually do like a brand summit. We try to get them for as much time as they'll give us, um, usually a day. Um, sometimes it could be multiple days if it's a, if it's a new client that we haven't worked with. Um, but we want to sit down with kind of, you know, eight to, I don't know, eight to 10 of their sort of key people that will be involved in the project and start to understand who they are. And we have a series of exercises that we run through um, that uh, sort of help to kind of ask these questions of, you know, who are you? What are you doing? Where do you want to go? And those are like the really sort of key important questions. Uh, you can uh, take a look. There's uh, some of it is kind of based off uh, the sprint model. Um, the, the D school has actually a lot of the Stanford D school. If you go to their website, they have a lot of information on running sprints. Um, there's also a book that uh, someone from the Google design team has put out. Um, I think it's just called sprint. Um, uh, but you can find a lot of those ideas of how we kind of do things. And we, we pull from those. We have some things that we do that are a little bit unique, but not that different. Um, but that's really the first step is, is trying to understand, trying to get at the core at what, of who they are and what they're trying to do. And uh, after that, uh, we have a strategist who's really involved with that. Uh, and we come back with sort of um, a presentation of findings. Um, usually it's the... If we do everything right, it's just, it's the quietest meeting that we have where everyone's just kind of nodding their head. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but at, 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 the, at the onset, it's really important to have some agreement on what, what we're all doing. Um, because if you don't, what happens is you get off, you get, you start and then you get halfway through. And one of the people, one of the persons that should have been there that you should have talked to originally has feedback or you haven't, heard, we haven't heard this one thing that they think is really important. We haven't heard from sales and they have like very strong opinions about this or that. So getting that information up front is sort of critically important, um, not only because it, it derails the process later, but also because uh, it allows us to really think through the, have all the pieces at the beginning. Um, so we're not trying to adjust and the designers, our, our design team, once we have all those, that information, we can really start to synthesize it and understand it and come up with solutions. Um, so that's a really key part of what we do. The, the next step for us after that uh, is to move into creative concepting. So that's taking uh, what we heard and we usually come back with you know, two to three, sometimes four different concepts, different directions. Um, so you know, knowing that these are the goals, what if we take it in this direction? What if it looks a little bit more like this? And they're very visual, so we'll show, we might show a mark, we, we'll show it in situation uh, or in situ, uh, we'll show it sort of, you know, what, you know, what are the, you know, what, what it might look like on a business card, what it might look like. Um, so taking it out of the abstract and into the real, what does it look like on sales collateral? Uh, it's really important too, because we're trying to, again, uh, make something out of nothing. I mean, the brands and marks and symbols don't mean anything until you assign meaning 
uh, and they don't really mean anything until they're real. So, so helping our clients move past the idea of just a, you know, a little blob on a, on a screen to sort of, this is a real thing that kind of can, can start to live in the real world uh, is really important. Um, once we kind of get, uh, there's a lot of refinement usually um, based on those concepts. And then once we get sort of agreement, uh, then we would move forward with producing all the pieces that need to be produce, produced. Amazing. Um, so the next question we have is from Thao Chivu. Um, hi, thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Do you have any specific resources you found helpful um, on your journey as a self-taught designer? Yes, the internet. Um, I think you guys are incredibly lucky because there's a lot of things out there, um, a lot of resources out there that you know uh, didn't exist in the same way. Um, uh, I always read all the magazines I could. Uh, I was looked at a lot of books. I still do, and I think that's actually a really uh, you know, I, I still think uh, reviewing design books and reviewing work and in a tactile form is actually really important. So I, I, I do think that that's, a, that's something I, even in this age, I would still uh, continue to do. But, um, you know, Pinterest is an amazing resource. Uh, you can learn anything on YouTube. Um, you can really, uh, uh, our creative director actually, for our website, a lot of the motion that you see in here, um, some of the things he did uh, you know, when we redid our website, we needed motion and he had an idea of what he wanted, but he couldn't quite explain it. So he just went and learned how to do it. Um, to, took a couple tutorials and got into After Effects and actually made some really amazing things. Um, you know, Pinterest is great. Instagram is always great too. Um, there's some sort of design focused uh, sites. Behance is pretty nice. Dribble also was, has a lot of sort of interesting things. Uh, I also, uh, and I still do this to the day, to this day, I, I follow a lot of the studios uh, and agencies that I really admire. And um, when they post case studies, when they post work, I really try to dig into it and see what makes it special. Um, so I think you can start to, to see what people are actually doing and what's actually out in the world, um, but also sort of staying ahead of, uh, you know, what are the trends? How are people designing things? Um, and I think, uh, th you know, now these days, uh, you guys are, uh, really blessed to have a lot of different resources. Awesome. Um, Alyssa Ellis is asking, which one of the projects you showed do you feel you had the largest impact? Why? And do you have suggestions for making work that is genuinely meaningful and impactful? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I think I showed you all my favorites. Um, and I don't know if I really have a preference. I don't know if I think one was sort of more than, than the other. Um, I always say this, you know, we love all our projects equally. Um, uh, but, you know, I think, I think that um, the, the Bears Ears project we did with Patagonia was really extraordinary. Um, we got a lot of, I mean, and it's, it, it's as much, I mean, it's, this is Patagonia's thing. I mean, this is who they are and this is what they believe. And, um, you know, it was one of the first chances that they, they've done environmental work for years and years and years. Uh, but this is one of the first times they sort of let that, uh, you know, the, the divide between sort of uh, environmental and marketing kind of come down just a little bit. But, um, you know, I think we, I think it was in the news. Um, and I think it, you know, it was a way for people to go experience that site in a way that they couldn't necessarily and really understand what Bears Ears was and what it meant. Uh, and Patagonia has been unflinching on how, on their sort of commitment to, to environment, uh, environmental work and I have a huge amount of admiration for them, uh, for that. Um, but just the chance to kind of work with them on that. I mean, you know, this, this was their thing. I, that was, that was, um, uh, extraordinary. And I, I, I believe that, you know, the impact is theirs. Um, and the, but, you know, just being able to kind of, uh, help accentuate that, I think, is, is something that I've really appreciated. Yeah, it's totally valid. Um, Sonia Shah is asking, there are uh, a lot of really cool designers, design firms, but sometimes it feels like many of them are similar or could create similar work. How do you try to make yourself stand out and what do you look for in differentiating between new talent? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I think that there is always the, uh, that is uh, on the interactive side. Once you start to see a certain amount of work, you start to see patterns repeat. 
um, there is a lot of work that sort of um, uh, does get to be the same. And I think for us, I think we're, um, we're kind of looking for, uh, you know, it's like, how do you distinguish yourself? It's, that's really the perennial question for, for us and for our brands. How do you make, how do you make the, the ongoing new, how do you make things? Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see brands, you know, it used to be you go, you know, eight, nine, 10 years between rebrands. And now it's like three to four years. And I think there's just this sort of desire to kind of keep relevant, keep new, uh, and, and show your work in new ways. And I, I think for us, it's not really, we're not always looking for a particular, particular style or aesthetic. I think, um, I, I think standing out is, is, is always a challenge. Um, but I think for us, I think we're often looking for sort of deeper thought, um, engagement, um, you know, the aesthetics matter, but also the thinking behind it, um, the ability to kind of explain the thinking behind it, um, and the ability to, and, and sort of, and folks that are just starting out just sort of more of, a, a passion and a willingness to kind of, to get involved and, and to get into the details. Um, so I think, um, you know, showing that is, is not an easy thing to do, uh, in a portfolio, but that's always what we're looking for. Awesome. Um, I know we're kind of running tight on time, so maybe like two more questions left. Uh, so the next one from Madeline Graham, which I think is actually really relevant given, um, you know, the shift to tech. Um, do designers have a role in code? How much coding like HTML, CSS, Java knowledge should a graphic designer have? Um, and then I guess you kind of answered this, but like any other recommendations um, when applying to internships for design interns and what do you look for? Yeah, for sure. Um, th this is like the, the huge debate in the design community. Should designers code or should they not? And this has been going on for a while. Um, I'm a little, I'm a little torn on it. Uh, the short answer is uh, we don't, you don't need to, or at least at Upper Coin, you don't need to, uh, designers don't need to code. Um, it's not a bad thing to know. Um, we have, we're lucky because we have amazing developers that uh, respect the design. They understand design intent. They, um, a lot of times they'll add interactive elements that, you know, the designers didn't even think of that make things better. So you know, I've had so many experiences handing off to developers where you don't get the thing that you thought you were going to get. Um, but with our developers, we, you know, they, they really get it. They sweat the details and it makes things really work for us. Um, so our, our designers are not expected to code. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to know. Um, if you're working a lot with developers, just having some baseline understanding of what they're talking about or why, you know, um, what the, what it is and how it works. I think it's helpful, um, but I, 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 I think that it's better to be a really strong designer than to be, you know, a, a good designer and a good developer. I think, I think it's better to focus in. Um, uh, as you're starting out and, and, and you're young and getting started, uh, it's good to be broad. I think as you get further on in your career, it's, it makes a lot more sense to focus in and, and narrow in. Um, I don't think we'd hire a designer if they coded, but I don't think it would hurt either. Great. And then to end this, so Derek Chow is asking, um, what were some obstacles when we started Upper Quad that are not as prevalent today and what obstacles exist today that did not exist in the past in terms of your success as a designer and also founder? And I guess just to um, add on to this, to cap off this presentation, like what is the um, biggest piece of advice you'd provide to these students today given um, Upper Quad has been in existence for almost 10 years, more than 10 years? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, the, so it's interesting. Um, so 10 years ago, it was like the last kind of great, it was the great recession. So it was very similar in a lot of ways um, uh, to now. I mean, I think um, it was really challenging. Some things that were really challenging, um, you know, just getting started. Uh, it wasn't because of just the way things were, it just, it, it actually made it a little bit easier. Um, because, I mean, in other words, finding office space was not hard. Finding people to work with wasn't hard. Um, and over the last 10 years, that's become a lot harder. Um, but, um, you know, projects were a little bit, uh, it was a little bit more difficult to bring in projects. Um, and, you know, that shifted as well, just as we got going. So, 
Um, yeah, I, I don't think, you know, I think that, um, I think that anybody who tells you that there was one perfect and golden time to do anything is, is not telling you the truth. I think there's, you know, there's, there's always going to be challenges no matter what time you start. There's always going to be challenges no matter, um, you know, whether you're just getting started or whether you're in the middle of your, your career or at the end of your career. And I think that, um, there wasn't, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there's no sort of perfect time. So it's hard to say if there were, there were really challenges that, you know, if it was harder or, or less hard back then, if there, if there are greater challenges than there would be now, um, there's going to be challenges no matter what. And I think what everybody, uh, has to do, I think what, you know, is, 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 uh, pushing through those challenges and, um, there's some things that are going to get a lot harder and there's some things that are going to get a lot easier. And, um, you know, for us, it's, it's, there's, you know, the, the, the problems have always shifted. You know, we go from, uh, we're really lucky to have some projects and all of a sudden we go, uh, you know, the conversations go very quickly from what are the next projects to how are we going to do these projects? Um, so there's always, there's all, the, the solutions to today's problems become the, the source of, of tomorrow's. So I think just keeping an open mind, keeping positive, keeping moving forward uh, is absolutely critical, whether it was 10 years ago, whether it's now. Yeah, I think that's great advice, especially thinking about how um, all of us need to persevere through this time. And I, I think that's, you know, that's great advice. Like there's no time that is like the best time, um, which is, yeah, awesome. So thank you again uh, for being part of this presentation, you know, Business Today, Design Nation. We're so happy to have you here. And um, I have one, one of the students even in the chat has said phenomenal presentation and insights, which I think does summarize this pretty well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for your time. And we're really, really happy to have you um, in this virtual presentation uh, as well. So thanks. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it, Grace. And thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Um, see you at 2.30 p.m. for our next keynote. All right. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Bye-bye.